And we're live. So uh, welcome to the IQ Focus uh, Technology of a Pandemic. Uh, we'll be joined by some people uh, from the live entertainment, live music space to talk about some of the ways in which technology is uh, helping to resolve, or hopefully resolve, um, and mitigate some of the effects on our industry of the coronavirus. The recent pandemic that's decimated the industry, it's changed the face of our industry completely as we know it. Um, almost overnight back in March, uh, total closure of festivals, so false, false hope, some optimism out there. Uh, venues um, having a really tough time, festivals having an incredibly tough time. Um, all live music operations from artists to crew to every, you know, every aspect of the live music industry has been uh, shut down almost immediately. Um, over time, we've seen uh, restrictions coming uh, into play in various uh, territories. We're seeing um, differences in restrictions being lifted, both in terms of the uh, restrictions and the uh, velocity of those restrictions. And then suddenly the, some, of the, um, some of those restrictions get put back in, um, which makes everything very, very unpredictable. That's one of the things we want to talk about later. Um, what do we think is going to be is going to take to uh, you know get the live industry kind of back on track? Um, is it antiviral? Is it technology? Is it um, is it a vaccine? Are we waiting for a vaccine to see the uh, the effect of COVID disappear from the live music industry? Um, until then, um, we need to uh, figure out how we're going to. Make uh, make a fist of the situation as we as we find ourselves. Um, there's going to be technology. There's going to have to be communications with uh, customers. There's going to be uh, a new way of doing business on the back end. Whether that's um, whether that's the uh, the ticketing, whether that's the the way that venues are run. So um, we are going to be looking at uh, this COVID COVID tech panel. I guess you could call it. Um, we're going to be looking at some of the things that we can control. Um, outside of the things that we can't control that are, that are governmental or regulatory. Um, so we're going to look at some of the technology, but also factor in some of the things that uh, we can't actually control because some of the things that we need to mitigate using technology and processes is some of the regulatory environment that's, that's being put in place. So, um, so you know, is there, uh, is there software that can help with access control? Is the biometrics that can help with um, managing venues? Is the uh, so software and technology that can help us to manage social distancing? Is there, you know, seating? Is there, uh, how do we manage uh, cleanliness in venues now that we have this extreme regime of cleanliness required? So, um, so we've got uh, five people uh, joining me today. Uh, Bridget, uh, Joran, John, Paul, and Adam. Um, I'm going to allow each of those uh, people to introduce themselves a little bit and have a, a quick introduction to each person. Each, each person on the panel today has been hard at work on uh, various aspects of technology that supports uh, mitigating some of those COVID risks. They'll explain uh, what, uh, what those are. And then we're going to have a discussion around the, um, the, uh, the ongoing, I guess, effect of COVID and how we how we think that's going to play out and manage that going forward. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Paul Toomey. Um, Paul, you have the floor. Explain a little bit about um, what you've been doing. Thank, thanks, Steve. Um, you know, I, I'm with um, Biosecurity Systems, and we've been really looking at how do you help uh, uh, travel and event and other forms of public infrastructure. Um, diminish infection risks such that you can go back to work um, and been engaged with public public health authorities and with and with asset owners and others about trying to figure out you know we've been in a world where everything's been black it's all everything's been turned off or white everything's open but really the economy and the and the disease demands us working in the gray if you like how do we how do we still manage risk 
in a type of infection and at the same time do things that both make our people safer, our staff safer, our patrons safer, and importantly, make people feel more confident. Um, we've been doing this with the airline industry, with airports and um, with events facilities. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more detail about that later. Um, we'll move over to Bridget now. Bridget from Megaforce. Yes, um, hello. I'm uh, Bridget Foos from Megaforce um, and ATDS Europe. Uh, we are a stage constructing company and uh, due to COVID-19, um, no festivals uh, take place, so um, no one needs any stages. Um, and uh, therefore, or to find a way back to normal life or to do events in any way, we made up our minds and uh, constructed some uh, technic technical um, installations um, for bringing the event business back to life like um, like uh, fever detection, biometric fe fever detection, or uh, contactless hand washing and disinfection and stuff like that. Um, and I think uh, one, the one thing are the yet regulations from the government uh, you have to take care of, but you also have uh, to have a look on the audience and uh, also on the artist, so that the audience and the artist and all the people working backstage feel safe during these uh, strange and hard times. Fantastic. Thank you for that, uh, Bridget. Clearly a lot to, lot to do there. So you're taking, yeah. tackling, uh, tackling a lot there. Uh, Joran. Hi, I'm Joran de Wachter. I'm with Seeds.io. Uh, we have an application that works with any uh, online ticketing system and allows people to make floor plans uh, and to allow people who want to go to venues and concerts to pick their seats. Um, I think the couple of things that were mentioned today was the role of technology and communication and making people feel safe. And I think um, that's important because what we have is a, a set of tools that allow to apply social distancing rules, which means that at the moment of buying a ticket, people can see where they will sit and how much safe space they will have when they go to a venue. Now, we believe that rebuilding trust um, is going to be a key aspect of bringing people yeah. back to events. Um, and I think that um, by showing people where they will sit um, and how they will be safe in the venue is an absolutely key component for that. Great stuff. Thank you, uh, Joran. Um, Adam. Adam Goodyear. Uh, thank you, Steve. I'm uh, Adam. I'm the CEO and founder of Real Life Tech. Uh, Real Life Tech is a technology company that improves the experience at live events by making it safer for fans and more profitable for venues and event organizers. We do this by bringing together the data that exists within these environments. So that's anything from ticketing through to apps, web, CRM, access control, point of sale and location data. And we create a single view of the fan across their entire journey. And we use this information to turn what used to be relatively dumb front end facing systems into smart and responsive ones. So venue apps and websites, their email and messaging systems that used to just deliver basic news and information can now do things like mobile ordering and contactless collection. We can do uh, delivery to seat or even delivery to car. And then important personalized safety information and messaging, as well as crowd density management, heat mapping and contact tracing. And the two most important things is a safe return and also as importantly it provides a vital revenue stream for venues and events that are returning with likely a an extremely limited capacity and we work with over 70 of the world's leading venues events and destinations including the o2 in london uh, the outside lands festival in san francisco and the indy 500 at the indianapolis motor speedway and our technology is going to be at the forefront of some of the world's first returning events and uh, we're looking forward to making them both safe and importantly profitable. 
Fantastic. Thanks for that, uh, Adam. A good detailed description of, of the, the stuff you've been getting involved in. Sounds like you have a good uh, sense of what people are looking for. Um, John uh, Sharkey uh, from ASM Global, the venues, uh, venues viewpoint. Thanks, Steve. Um, I look after the European business for ASM Global um, and part of the global leadership team. Um, all of our venues have been down from the end of March. And during that time, we've been starting to try and work out what do we come back to whenever we do come back. Um, so we've pulled together across our global business um, a product called Venue Shield. And I'll just give you a quick uh, couple of moments of that. Uh, let me just hook you in. So the, the idea of uh, Venue Shield is to basically look at uh, been bespoke to every venue um, that we are working with. And the idea is to build confidence back for people to come back whenever we do get to reopen with confidence um, in our whole approach to the world that we're in, not just for COVID-19, but you know what comes down the road from there. We focused in on areas that cover environmental hygiene, workforce safety, um, looking at technology and equipment that's going to drive the strategies for each of the venues as well as food service, customer journey, and public communications. So the, the umbrella is that each venue will create their own bespoke product coming from a library that basically has each of these areas as a core foundation to the recovery strategy for each venue. Um, and that's the, the, the main driver to it. Um, so happy to um, open up the discussion um, beyond that. but. For us, the key thing is we need to understand that we do have a viable business to come back to and that it has to work to generate confidence, not just at back of house um, and front of house, but with our staff um, and everybody coming through our buildings. Uh, and especially whenever we are going to be changing uh, to suit the jurisdictions that we operate in and also the changing state and cycle of where we are in the um, de in dealing with the um, with the virus. Great. Did you have a video to go on to show, John? Yeah, we we did. Uh, um, we were one of the first venues back with um, the UFC behind closed doors um, a couple of months back, and uh, I'd just like to give you a bit of a demonstration of um, how this has been applied. Uh, as I say, this one was behind closed doors. Um, with the, the first um, uh, performance of the UFC coming back in. But it gives you a bit of a feeling for what we're trying to do in terms of uh, generating that confidence. Um, so. This was a leading moment, not just for a company, but for the industry. ASM Global, in partnership with the UFC, we've shown how to come out of the crisis the key to this thing was to, to get down here and pull off an event that was going to be safe, where my staff, my fighters, and everybody involved could come here, pull this thing off safely. ASM Global has a, a program right now called Venue Shield. We at the UFC submitted a 30 page document to the governor of, of Florida. These guys have a whole list of protocols that, that they put in place too to make sure that when you come to their arenas, your live event not only goes off smoothly, but everything is as safe as it can possibly be. We started it to really enhance the customer journey of the future. We knew that the customer journey was going to change, and this was the first, you know, I don't want to say test run, it was the first run uh, top to bottom for it, and our customers include the artists, the athletes, the entertainers, the promoters. We're, we're the first sporting event back in the United States. Everybody's watching right now to execute this thing perfectly has never been more critical than it is right now. And this is the group we trusted to do it. Food and beverage, to event management, to security, to testing. It, it, it was a great learning experience for everybody. And it was a successful experience, 100% through and through. And, and it was a great credit to the city of Jacksonville, the state of Florida, UFC, and for ASM Global. Fantastic. Thanks, John, for that um, really great demonstration of um, how you can uh, you know, deploy that stuff at um, at scale. Um, I, I have one very uh, quick question on that, um, which is, does that work at all levels? Like, how does it work on, like, for that's a large venue, you've got a great big client with UFC, clearly that's a scale 
product. But if I've got, you know, a hundred seat comedy club, um, does Venue Shield also support me there? Yeah, it does actually. We um, because we've got venues across the world that big scale up to stadiums and and down to theatres. Um, the the library is there for uh, uh, making sure that your venue gets a bespoke solution. Um, so much so actually that although we're using it for the ASM uh, global venue portfolio, um, in the UK we will be looking to provide the service um, FOC to smaller venues that don't have that overhead to invest in that kind of strategy. So we will be looking to try and help um, with the smaller venue recovery as well and using some of the library to be able to help them on the way back to be sp bespoke to the solution that they need for, for their venue and their jurisdiction. Okay, fantastic. That sounds like a, a good strategy. Um, so where to begin um, on the, the discussion about technology? I think for kind of understanding a little bit about the, the issue, the challenge, right? And I know that, um, uh, you know, the, the UFC guys there just mentioned it. It's about a change in the, the customer journey. Um, I'm interested in your take on, you know, I know that you have an interest in how this kind of plays out in the future, Paul, just not just around COVID, but, you know, this is, this is now um, a thing that everyone that's alive now is going to be thinking, well, it could be something else in the future. Like, what's the, what is, what is this, um, you know, it isn't just a case of this one's going to come and then it's going to go away and then we're back to normal, right? No, I think no, I think that's exactly right. Um, we've got, you know, if, and if you're from the Western Pacific um, or Asia Pac, you, you know that COVID nineteen is just one of, you know, five or six diseases we've had, which have been an epidemic, if not pandemic, status for the last uh, 15, 20 years. We can expect to see that happen, keep going, and I think that the challenges for events uh, organisers and for facilities is to make the investment now. Not just for this 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 infection, but the future ones. I mean, it's a little bit more, one of you know we've got advisors and, and people we work very close to with who are from you know national security environments and senior politicians, etc. The, the comparison with September 11 is pretty clear. There was terrorism before, there was terrorism after, but the consumers and, and the governments and the regulators all saw things differently after September 11. I think it's the same thing's true for biosecurity and, and COVID 19. Everything is different now. So even after we get you know hopefully get some improvement. Uh, with, with vaccines, et cetera, in those couple of years, I think it's still important people make the investment in the sorts of facilities and um, uh, and equipment and solutions that consumers are going to keep looking for. I mean, that's what we found, you know, in our discussions, we, we provide a whole range of different uh, uh, screening facilities of thermal imaging and um, uh, blood, ox blood oxygen testing uh, and... Uh, uh, testing for heart rates and, and temperature testing, etc., for staff um, and even for even for patrons. But we also uh, have, have seen that our, our robots, particularly our disinfection robots, have got, become very important in, in, in environments where uh, customers are looking to see something tangible that they can say, "Oh, look, that's something different." And not only do they have a really good disinfection, but they also we, we literally have people having their photographs taken with the things. Um, and I think it's an indication of patrons and, and travellers are looking for a long-term symbol that this is some place I can trust. They're taking my safety seriously. Yeah, absolutely. That that kind of um, that kind of dovetails into the question that I, that I have around. Um, we've got two, you know, there's two sides to the, the equation here, which is kind of supply and demand being limited or, or you know having issues with um, with COVID. And what you're speaking to there, Paul, is, is a little bit about demand, like customers want to feel safe. Um, given that there has been, um, you know, there have been these prior coronavirus or, you know, you've, you've got like SARS and you've got uh, MERS. Has there been, um, has, has, has anybody on the, on the panel seen any um, kind of regional differences in the responses to COVID based on previous experience? Um, in, in that particular region, whether, you know, for, from an Asia pack perspective, SARS, Paul, um, have those venues and, and the industry been better prepared with technology, for example? And is there some stuff that we can learn as we're being hit with this first real, you know, to your point, yeah, this is the first real kind of big pandemic that's affected, uh, you know, our, the industry on a global scale. So are there learnings that we could take from, from other places that are more used to these types of diseases? I'll just make one quick observation and let others contribute. But one of the interesting ones has been the issue of thermal imaging testing for temperature. Um, 
in in Asia Pac, um, consumers expect it, and that comes from the SARS experience. Um, in some parts of the world, public health authorities, for good reasons, are saying, you know, this is not necessarily the blood oxygen might be a better indicator, or other things are better indicators than temperature. Um, but I think it's indication. I mean, I'm in Australia at the moment. There was literally uh, complaints at airports when people were not getting tested for, for, from consumers. They were complaining they weren't getting tested for temperature. So I think they're good examples of um, yeah, there are regional differences of expectation. Um, and I just make this last observation about this. We should understand that there are many other pandemics potentially coming along the track. And also, particularly for Europe, Africa has stopped doing immunization because of COVID-19. So we're going to have a big upright upswing in things like measles and things like that, yeah. where yeah, again, yeah. checking is going to be important. John, you've got a, a global network of venues. Have you seen any 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 regional differences in responses? Yeah, I think very early on, it was um, very clear to see that, especially um, the Asia region that um, had been through uh, SARS was much better prepared, but much better prepared across society, not just um, at venue level. So at Hong Kong Convention Exhibition Centre, for example, they were right over the top of it, but it's part of a societal response early doors. Um, I think the biggest challenge across the business at the moment is initially we were thinking that it was all going to be seasonal, and as it's quite clearly becoming the case that COVID isn't seasonal, um, everybody's having to pivot and everybody's trying to respond to the science as well. And even the, the, the development in terms of scientific uh, understanding is moving. So where we had strategies, early doors that were much more about surfaces um, rather than airborne infections, we've seen that started to gravitate to more focus on airborne transmission, um, still having to concentrate on surfaces. But I think just generally across the board, even although there are some parts of the world that were ahead of the game, um, we are still trying to play up with um, scientific understanding. And I think one thing that's driving an awful lot of this is where different territories are going through either um, a peak or a second wave or an extension of a first wave, where there is a societal pressure, we're starting to see a lot of response and focus, which obviously isn't ideal because we want to be prepared before the pressure hits, not trying to deal with it when the pressure's there. Fantastic. Um, so you, you've just spoken there to a, a really kind of interesting thing that we're all discovering now, which is, you know, we, we, we had this first wave, yet yeah, everything got shut down, everything opens up a little bit. Now we're seeing these localized, quite aggressive, like very fierce, like short term local lo localized lockdowns. Um, and, you know, I mean, I'm interested to, to I'm obviously interested in data. Data is a, a thing that I've, I've been I've cared about since forever. Um, um, Adam, you mentioned kind of AI um, and data in your um, introduction. I'm wondering whether there's a there's a, a role to play here because it feels like when you've got a very very unpredictable live um, event production environment, um, one of the bigger challenges is going to be you know you've got unpredictable regulatory environment. Insurance is the big driver of our business. You know, <laughs> it kind of runs our business. Um, what, what role is, is data going to play in helping insurers manage risk in a kind of, you know, a post-COVID? Because to, to push Paul's point, we are in post-COVID. There's, there's no doubt that we are in this, this new way of, um, of working and living. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the hopes that, that, that I take from the situation that we find ourselves in is that technology and, and data can be adopted uh, much more readily than it has been previously. And the ability, uh, what a lot of people don't know is the amount of data that sits in all event systems already uh, is, uh, is huge and very, very detailed, but it's also unstructured. And the ability to be able to, to structure that data can start to provide a lot of potential uh, early warnings. It can also start to provide the ability to be able to, to, contract, to contact trace and then respond. But I guess what, what we need to be looking at as an industry is how investment is made. 
governments around the world are are helping to support this vital industry, and it is a vital industry. But in order to do that, the industry must support itself, and it must be able to invest in the right areas, in investing in the data that is already sitting there. It's not only an economic benefit, but it's going to be a health benefit in the future as well. And that plays into not just the, um, the kind of consumer, uh, the kind of fan, the attendee health, but also, I guess, from a staff and crew kind of perspective as well, because that's the, the the other side of this coin, isn't just that you need people to um, to come to shows, you need people to work for shows as well. Um, Bridget, um, your 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 um, your work around um, uh, festivals. I'm interested to know a little bit about the, you know, venues and festivals. We talked a little bit about different different sizes, but venues and festivals are quite different propositions, are they not? From a um, you know planning and and keeping uh, kind of clean perspective. Well, are you, are you seeing any um, real uh, obvious wins in technology for from an uh, outdoor event perspective? Bridget Harris. Bridget, you there? Sorry. Um, yes, of course, there are differences. Um, you have to use different te technology because, um, for, exa for example, a, a disinfection shower does not work uh, properly uh, outside or outdoor. Uh, you can use it indoor uh, for venues, but um, at festivals, you will have to have a place where there is no wind and everything is um, like a, a clear space. So it's very difficult for some technologies to, to be um, installed at festivals. No, none of Paul's um, disinfectant robots at festivals now. Pardon? None of Paul's disinfectant robots at festivals. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, I I, uh, I think the one of the bit one of the challenges you know as I've been working through stuff with the the music venue trust in the UK and the, the kind of um, you know open every venue safely kind of um, campaign revs reopen every venue safely has been um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, equipment management and equipment cleanliness. Um, I guess from a uh, you know disinfectant or, or cleanliness perspective, that might vet, that might be different at a venue compared to a festival because you, you've got everyone bringing their own stuff. Or yes, it's um, I mean at a venue you have a loading dock and all the stuff, um, the cases and the materials are brought in uh, at that loading dock. Um, at the festival, you have several stations where the trucks are placed and where where um, where the material um, is uh, is kept, and um, therefore we do have a solution: uh, uh, hygiene hygiene um, uh, hygiene gate, which can be placed directly at the trucks uh, loading dock. So when the cases go out, they go directly through this disinfection shower. Um, and uh, at the festival, I mean, you are in the, it's an open air uh, um, place, um, and the virus is not that um, aggressive like in closed venues, closed rooms. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of closed rooms, so Joran, um, seated venues, um, seats they are, seated venues, um, there's, a, there's a real role, uh, you know, ticketing. Is a, is a big um, part of the technology piece of, of live entertainment. Um, you know, um, making uh, social distancing in venues is is, um, you know, is is hard when you when you've got uh, a, a standing venue. Um, seated venues, maybe it's, it's somewhat easier because you can you can run different seat maps. I guess. Um, I guess the the, um, the the challenge is more uh, as I see it. Um, Making sure that customers stick to the rules. <laughs> um, you know, like, does the, does the venue need to take the seats out? Actually, right? Are you reflecting what the situation is in the venue, or are you kind of managing the um, the venue? Well, I think I think the key point there is to have flexibility. You know, um, you know, there are certain things that we can't control. And they were mentioned before. We don't know when a second wave will hit a particular place. We don't know um, what, what authorities will do. So what you need to do from, from a technology perspective anyway, and which is what we're trying to offer, is to um, have this flexibility that allows you to play, to react quickly 
to changing uh, situations. And sometimes, you know, um, you need a social distancing rule of one seat. Sometimes you need a social distancing rule of two seats. Sometimes you need to uh, make sure the aisle seats are not are not taken um, at any time. And so what you need to have is, is the possibility to have all those different scenarios uh, made possible in the way you present things to to the ticket buyer because um, you know if people what, what are the, I, I'll come back to what I said earlier trust is going to be key at any point customers need to know that they can trust the venues that they can trust the organizers that they can trust the situation where they're going to and feel comfortable that they will be safe and showing them that this is the case is, is key uh, and, and the challenge of course is that defining what is safe is changing across space and time. We, we have customers in about 200 different countries, oh, sorry, in, um, across the world. We have about 200 uh, customers across the world. And what we see, we clearly see is that those who apply uh, social distancing rules in when they allow people to pick their seats have come to business much faster than those who haven't. And so um, what that means in terms of when people are on the ground and whether seats are physically blocked is a different matter. Um, but you know, the first step is to organize the event and, and 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 sell the tickets and make sure that people actually feel that they can trust what's going to happen and that they and their family will be safe when they go to an event. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, there's, there's a balance to to, uh, to play here between um, you know, to, to Paul's point, is that you've seen people taking selfies with the disinfectant robots, right? They're probably cute-looking robots. Um, they're not kind of Skynet type disinfecting robots. Um, I guess that there's a balance between um, activity that makes somebody uh, makes customers feel safe and activity that makes people think, "Oh my God, this is terrible!" What, like I'm I'm entering some some awful area that all this activity needs to take place. It, I guess some stuff needs to be kind of visible and an open demonstration of responsibility as a, as a venue or an event organizer, um, and other stuff just needs to happen in the background to make sure that, for example, food service is safe. Um, I think the um, you know one, one of the area one of the big areas um, around uh, around venue operations is obviously in food services F and B because a lot of money is generated from F and B. Um, John, are you what are you what are you seeing in um, in kind of F and B tech around self service, for example, or is there is there kind of stuff that ASM is really taking the lead on? Um, th there's a lot of good stuff being developed at the moment, uh, whether it's from uh, contactless uh, ordering or contactless payment. Um, even to uh, delivery to sea. Um, so I think that's definitely going to be the direction of travel um, as we go forward. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, practically in there, certainly in the current climate under reduced capacities and social distancing, is where um, out the role alcohol plays. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to try and um, to be policing that and trying to obviously have and let people enjoy themselves and have a great time. And that's what we really need to, to let people do. That's what they were doing. That's what they need to do. But obviously, it becomes a much greater challenge for us under social distancing whenever we're in a um, al uh, heavy alcohol consumption event. But certainly, I think the technology is going to change and it's going to change not to come back because we'll find ways of making it easier, even if it's the, you know, the e-bar guys doing the um, the, the, beer, the beer pouring uh, remotely, uh, automated beer pouring. So there'll be things that will move, um, and I'm pretty sure Adam's all over it, his stuff as well, that I think will change. And it'll be one of these technology bridges that left to our own devices we would have probably been very slow to adopt. But once we realize that it's uh, not as bad as we thought it was, um, and there's some positive values to um, embracing the technology, then we won't turn back. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a sentiment I've heard a, a lot, and I, I, I agree with that. This this is actually just, well, it's a terrible thing. It's, it's actually put fast forward on a lot of um, industries um, in terms of it, it adopting technology, partly because out of necessity, but it's also things are getting adopted that would have taken a while when they were done in pockets, whereas actually we've all had to adopt a new technology yeah. very quickly. Um, uh, Steve, can I just come in on, on, on one point there? Because I, I think what, what we're seeing, and John's right, we've been doing a, a, a huge amount of work around, uh, around contactless collection and uh, how to, to, to make the ordering and uh, collection and delivery of food mm -hmm. safe. 
But one of the key things we're also seeing is the amount of collaboration that is happening uh, within providers within the industry. So not only with companies like ASM and, and AG, but also involving Levy and companies like us working with, with companies like, like Durham's, for example, in being able to take the information that sits in their systems and being able to knit those all together. And I think that's one of the most exciting points is the collaboration that is happening within the industry that, that previously was a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I've got, um, I'm just gonna make a, a quick uh, kind of housekeeping announcement just to remind everybody who's watching online that um, in the comments, um, if, you, uh, if you type a question in the comments, then um, I will do my best to raise those with the, uh, with the panel and get some answers to the questions that we've got here. Um, we've got a couple of questions uh, coming in. Um, one from Raki, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Um, um, so one of the questions is, you know, we've got all this amazing technology. Um, um, we're going to have increased, you know, compliance. We're going to have, uh, you know, lower um, amounts of um, food and bev spend. Do you think that we're going to see an increase in kind of ticket prices um, to cover um, the uh, these increased costs? Is, is this going to get passed on to the um, to the consumer, or is it, are these going to just become a new show cost and the cost of doing business? Who wants to take that? Of course, a politically sensitive question. Let me let, let me pick that one up. I think I think generally. Um, the whole economics of our business are changing um, remarkably at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. We, I think, are facing uncertain economic times. So therefore, right at the very top, the ticket prices are going to have to reflect uh, people's ability to pay and the choices available uh, in that climate. We um, have all got um, new overheads to absorb as it relates to uh, COVID. And we all need to find a way of being able to manage that systemically across our business lines. Um, and equally, at the same time, uh, the ancillaries um, are likely to change as well, whether that's food, whether that's merchandising, whether that's hospitality. Um, so I think at this point, everything's up for grabs in terms of how that new world um, changes. Technology's got to be a key part of it because it's part of the overall cost of how we deliver. Um, so it's not political saying that I, we don't have the answers right now um, and there will need to be a settling of what the new world looks like for our industry. Um, but I do think that um, we, if we've got operational costs we need to absorb, we need to find a way of being able to make that deliver, be able to be delivered at the expense or not at the expense of catering for the um, the amount of money that our consumers have in their pockets. So big challenge in us all. Um, but equally, what we've got to do first and foremost is bring everybody back to enjoying an experience that they were used to enjoying. And it's our job to make it look industrial behind the scenes and create a great customer ambience whenever they're coming through the building uh, and that they want to enjoy themselves and spend money with us. Um, and then if we've more events, more attendance, more spend, then we've got a greater capacity to absorb these um, costs into our business. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> thanks, John, for the, um, that insight there. The, um, the, the kind of challenges across venues um, and the different types of venues, I think, are probably quite different. And I, I'm interested to see what the panel's thoughts are around the use of technology and how that differs between, or could differ between, you know, clearly deploying um, um, you know, COVID compliance and some technology into, you know, a West End theatre is quite different to an arena, for example. Um, you know, just, just managing the difference between ingress and egress from, a, from that venue is quite, is dramatically different. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm interested to see if you've seen any um, examples that have really worked in one environment that wouldn't maybe be, um, have to be done completely differently in, in another environment. Any takers on that? From, a, from a, a small to large venue um, question, I can I can take that if you like, Steve. We work with with both um, small uh, theatre venues and large arenas and and stadiums. Um, the the what we look at is the commonality, and that uh, this has come through as a, as a theme throughout this panel. And I think it's really it's really key that from a 
uh, from a, a fan perspective, and we've surveyed thousands of fans, that being able to provide uh, reassurance, be able to provide information to them on how they are going to be kept safe uh, is absolutely key, whether you are at a, uh, a small venue and destination or whether you are at a large one. So what we're seeing is that, that clients at all sides are focusing on how you can personalize information to certain blocks of tickets, for example, providing timed um, uh, ingress and egress as part of that, and then delivering safety messaging uh, around that area of seating that they're going to be. And that can be delivered both at small and large destinations. And then the second thing that people are worried about is, is how, are, how are you going to be profitable? Uh, and the ability to be able to ensure that that you're providing a good experience but maximizing spend per head is again a commonality uh, at both large and small levels. Fantastic. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Paul. I think that's, um, there's an, there's, if you take, you've got to take a solution perspective on, on this issue and your point about facilities being different means there's going to have to be different solutions for them and importantly, local phenomenon being being uh, being different um, the sort of the points the budget was making about open air and, and, and the risk you've got in open air is different to what is enclosed area what you can actually provide for a small small facility this is what you need to do for a large one what do you do for large scale people passing through or not and then what I think throughout all of this what is it you can say back to local regulatory environments to say you know hold their hands to say it's safe for you to go through the journey you're going through, um, and we find that with the you know with with the range of range of equipment and, and and services we offer, you know, nursing services, others, and some of the big facilities are actually doing testing. Um, uh, it, it's very much focused around uh, both a what, how fast you need to get people through a particular space, um, what you need to do to prove to the local regulatory environment that you were doing a safe space or at least risk, least risky space, and then. What is it that sticks in the mind of the consumer as being, okay, I feel like I'm being looked after. And those combinations are going to be are going to be different depending upon where you are and the size of the facility. I think so, that's an important point, um, which is uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the accounting, I guess, to the local regulatory bodies. Um, they, it, it feels to me as if um, they're quite different reporting requirements and quite different legislative environments. Um, so from a, from a technology standpoint, about you know, providing data to support um, a venue's um, claim that it was operating safely, um, I guess this comes back down to you know, capturing a lot of data in order to be able to demonstrate uh, risk mitigation from an insurance perspective. Like, are we, are we going to see increased, um, increased data capture um, at venues? You, know, you, you spoke earlier about um, venues to doing um, heat mapping and heat, uh, temperature testing on, on the way in. Is that information kind of linked back to uh, individual people? And are there any privacy issues that, that we're going to see from a technology standpoint? Because that seems to me that you know, the, the next phase of this is where we all just get used to it in two years' time and everyone has their temperature checked and there's a whole raft of new information suddenly being um, kept and having to be, you know, data is burdensome, as we all know on this panel, I'm sure. And it's going to be different for how do you treat patrons versus how do you treat staff? And you may well find a situation where you have to have uh, employees in a different regime um, than you would for people who are coming in only you know once or twice a year. More more frequent testing or more frequent um, more better, a different a different data point. Hmm. Hmm. I think in the short term and in, in the immediate short term, whilst we we're still in reduced capacity and pilots, I think that. The biggest factor in there is going to be of interaction with local authorities is going to be how we interact with test, track, and trace. Uh, because obviously the ticketing and the manifest and where people are seated is going to be pretty key. Um, we're still going to have, you know, back to your point, um, the the biggest challenge across the venue types, I think, probably drops um to the public circulation space, um, the toilet provision. Uh, and also, quite importantly, for the bigger venues, for the stadiums, is the overground transportation uh, capacity to get people in and out. Uh, because we need to think about, uh, you know, in terms of the wider 
um, realm, not just the venues themselves. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. There are some real different challenges depending on the size and scale of venue. Um, but one of the key things that's definitely going to develop over the next three, four, five months is going to be that interaction with local authorities and how we work with them. Albeit that I think all of us are really seeing the reduced capacities as a necessary evil to get back to where we need to be because it doesn't matter whether you're an airline, a hotel or a venue, you're built to be able to operate viably at a certain capacity. And I certainly think that the current climate reduced capacities don't allow you to do that, um, certainly in the short term. Um, just on back on the, on that data point and, and track and trace, um, are we going to see um, you know, a requirement to, you know, <coughs> I buy four tickets, do I have to tell the um, ticket company my three friends that are coming with me? Do we, do, you know, are we, are we getting to that point? Is, is COVID going to be the thing that drives that data capture for, for events and it becomes a, a regulatory requirement? You can't attend or you can't operate an event unless you know everybody that's in the building. Is that is that a reality? Is that practical? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, in, in Germany, we already um, have small events. And uh, if you go there or if you're on the guest list, you have uh, to write down your name, your address or your, your phone number or email. So um, that in case of COVID-19, we can follow you up and uh, see who, who had contact with you. This is also um, practiced in um, restaurants or clubs or pubs in, in Germany. You always have to fill in a sheet uh, that's lying on the table with your table number, uh, the, the date, the time you arrive, the time you leave. Um, I mean, at the moment, you just write it down in a list. And I don't know, you have a lot of paperwork. Um, for the future, um, there are there should be a solution like an app or something like like that i guess because um it's if there is really a covid-19 case then it's very difficult to follow and to find out um who was in contact with that person but i think we will have to uh if you go to a concert with five friends you have to name the friends so you, uh, you know who is in the building or who is attending the festival i guess and Steve, this this is this should be a good thing. You know, this is this is what venues sh should be striving for prior to COVID anyway. But the reason to do it has now has now changed, yeah. and people to in, be able to enjoy events if they're willing to do that. And it, we're we're doing it across all of our portfolio, and it's it's a genuinely good thing. And we're seeing that fans are happy yeah. to do it when it's clearly explained. And that they know their data is being held yeah. securely and privately. I think it comes down to the same point that we made in the beginning, which is that it, we have to rebuild the trust with uh, people who want to go to events so that they know that they will be safe. And the same is true for their data and for their whereabouts. And so, um, you know, I don't think we. Um, I don't think we can wait for a vaccine or something else of that nature because it's going to be too long. We need to get people back into events and to rebuild that relationship. And I think the way we communicate about all of this is going to be absolutely key. We need to make sure that people know that they can trust event organizers and they can trust the venue owners. That thing, that um, the right thing will be done both in terms of social distancing when they book as when they get there, as everything else that is being done. So I think there's, there's going to be a need for a massive amount of increased transparency in how ticket buyers, how people who go to venues, go to events, are being treated both before and after and during the event. And so I think, you know, people who organize things will have to not just collect data, but also justify how they use the data and open up on how they do things. Uh, and, uh, you know, communication is key. It's a human business and, you know, in, 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 in human businesses, in order to build trust, you need to communicate as much as possible. Absolutely. Paul, go ahead. I was just coming to, I couldn't agree more than what people said, especially what Bridget said. We've actually been looking at, at, at an app and introducing an app uh, for that sort of confirmation of people coming on for where they are in um, uh, yeah, for tracing purposes. I was going to make an point of an observation about um, 
regional differences. One of the reasons we know is that in some parts of the world, I won't say where, you can't guarantee that the patron's telling you the truth, which has ended up being a problem. And so actually having things which basically goes back and forces people to confirm by really phone. Cool. Said, people that yeah. uh, 18 on 18, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the, the, the trust issue here is going to work both ways, right? Yeah. Because the re regulators and others are going to expect, expect, expect uh, you know, we've, we've been talking with people, promoters like Michael Durkin and others, you know, about what the accountabilities they're going to be under. So how do you help them, right? Not just how do you help the patron. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, so we've got uh, we've got about ten minutes left. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions from the, from the chat room, which is looking pretty busy. Um, um, a quick look. So I guess um, what's the from again? You know, I'm a ticket person. I like tickets. Um, What's the, um, do we think we're going to see um, changes to um, how we manage kind of short notice event cancellation? Like from a ticketing perspective, notifying, um, you know, I know there's some bands that are, are kind of, um, they commonly cancel shows and, and ticket companies are used to that. But do you think that we're going to have to get um, more, uh, more familiar with having to suddenly shut a show down? Um, and communicate very quickly with those with those customers. Um, and what do you do in a venue around communication with customers when um, you know you're in a, you're in a live event and suddenly someone um, someone is taken ill? Um, how, how does that situation affect an, an event in real time? Is, is is there a kind of an aspect of not just ingress and egress, but also managing the event using communication technology, kind of when the event's actually happening, especially on large large scale events. Probably festivals. We're seeing a lot of questions about social distancing at festivals. Um, that's that's a real. I think that's a real issue. Yeah, I mean, I think on, on two areas here, uh, there's is quite interesting. The the first thing is that you know, back to this, people need to feel confident about going out to to an event, and they need to um, feel confident about having a good time. The feeling confidence part. If you are going to have an event cancel at short notice, and um, if you're a punter, you're going to lose, or you're, the, the event could get rescheduled, or maybe maybe it doesn't get rescheduled. Maybe it's partway through, or it's a festival that's in its second day, and then it gets closed down. None of that's going to drive confidence. So we need, whether it's on the business side of the industry or the consumer side of the industry, we need to find a way of um, dealing with that underwrite, whether that's um, been able to pass it off, absorb it, uh, or or whatever the solution is, we need to get in a position that fundamentally how we structure things, people feel confident and feel confident enough about wanting to um, place that investment in their time and their money with us. So I think that is really, really key to try and make sure that we can, uh, can understand um, how people are investing with us and what we can do to try and protect that investment and give them the confidence to continue to go forward. I think that at its heart is going to be one of the big things that we're really going to have to deal with um, in the short term as we kind of start to pivot to a more medium, longer term. I think in the longer term, I think um, we are definitely going to have this as part of our, our future. Uh, initially, I was thinking that we get back to full capacities whenever we've got vaccines. I'm not necessarily sure that um, vaccines are going to come first. And I think we've got to find a way of creating that confidence and viability and, you know, ambience of and customer journey to, to basically make people want to come back out because they know that they're going to enjoy themselves. So I think we've got that to, to think about and um, certainly in the short term. Um, I think I'm not so sure that maybe a, a concert night, that somebody going ill at a concert night necessarily is is a bro public broadcast to everybody, and um, because at that point you still don't know whether or not um, it's a COVID situation, and you've still got to get tested and all the rest of it. I think where it might and could potentially be a challenge um, is if you're on a three or four day festival and there's a bunch of people that are identified. Um, I think that might uh, be an issue that we've got to try and deal with 
Uh, but as I say, that's out with my um, remit, uh, and I think an area. It, it, it doesn't matter what it comes back to here, whether it's whether it's the insurance underwrite or whether it's the enjoyment or whether it's the security of feeling safe. It's all about confidence. We just need to make sure we can design an industry that's going to make people feel confident about choosing to be with us and choosing to spend their time with us before, during and after. Yes, well, right. I think confidence is uh, confidence is one point, but uh, in, looking at the festivals, also awareness is very important because uh, we had the first lockdown. Now the lockdown is over. Um, people are going back to normal daily life, and um, they forget about the about the regulations or about uh, uh, staying safe and not shaking hands and not hugging each other. And when you imagine a festival, I mean, um, a three days festival with lots of alcohol. I don't have to tell uh, uh, to tell you how festivals are. I guess you you know you in the biz business. Um, we should take care that um, the the festival attendees, the, the 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 audience, that they are aware of of the problem, are still aware of that uh, virus, which is still here. It's not killed. Um, it's just it just it was just getting better, and therefore we don't have those strict regulations anymore. But um, it's our duty to show them, please keep social distancing, do not hug each other, and uh, stay safe. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, kind of fan confidence. It, it comes back to the the original question, which was, you know, what's the big dry, what's the biggest cha bigger challenge, supply or demand? Um, we haven't touched upon what's going to help um, tours manage risk or you know shows manage risk, um, whether it's a a Broadway or a West End show versus a big touring show that suddenly can't do ten dates in Italy. That's a you know we've, we've five minutes left, so we're not going to get into talking about. Um, the kind of uh, the trials and tribulations of touring in unpredictable um, uh, situations. That's that's for another another panel. Um, what I'd like um, as we as we kind of wrap this up um, is um, if everybody can um, if everyone if, if everyone's got like a, a piece of technology either that they would love to see that would help with um, uh, with COVID or the most interesting or kind of out there piece of technology that um, that you, uh, you that you have seen that could actually be useful. You can all um, phone a friend, have a think about it. And I'm thinking, um, uh, you know, the, the temperature kind of wristbands that I've seen that are, that are quite cool. Um, or, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's it actually, put, I, I would love to have seen one of Paul's disinfecting robots. I think you, you definitely need to have had a, a video of your disinfecting robot, Paul. You've, you've missed a trick there. Well, I think one of the things that's most interesting in the science perspective at the moment is uh, um, uh, fitness type monitors are, uh, uh, are beginning to show quite good uh, early indicators for changes in um, temperature, blood pressure, uh, blood oxygen levels, um, and, um, and, 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 and giving people indications they're sick before the symptoms have arrived. Mm -hmm. um, now, like many of these things, nothing's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's all about risk minimization, right? Um, now, putting together systems where we, we're the ones to do one we're looking at is how we put systems and AI around that to measure it for large periods. It's probably not so not such an issue for uh, one-off events, but for staff or for, you know, the area we think is very interesting is cruise liners, for instance. Um, that could be quite interesting, not just for COVID-19, but for other risks of, yeah. of infection. Yeah. Where you can get some long, long-term, longitudinal data. It goes back to the data question that others have made. Yeah, fantastic, Joran. Any um, any last thoughts on amazing technology you've seen or would like to see? Well, I'm not going to. I'm going to mention. I'm not, I've mentioned ours, um, which I think you know, to big ticketing, but guys are not offering at the moment. So I think that's an important one. Um, I think another thing that we are looking at but haven't done yet is something to uh, to be able to find place to find people visually to say this is where I've been sitting and this is the place that was next to me. Um, I think that would be that would be helpful um, so that you can actually uh, identify the the spatial relationship between one person sitting somewhere and another yeah. person sitting somewhere. Else. Uh, so for me, it's more about utilizing the familiar. 
that you know rather than the wacky out there types of technologies that the, the more you can utilize familiar technology link it together make it better that's the way that you're going to get real utility because if it's if it's too different then it, it won't be adopted and it will be too unfamiliar to fans and there's so much that can be done by just making those existing technologies better and smarter as um, as any of you who were at the ilmc that year and saw me wearing my google glasses that's um a case in point that, <laughs> that verifies adam's uh, adam's uh, the familiar is uh, adds utility much more um uh, bridget any last any last thoughts on on technology that you've you've seen that's working that you you like that's really simple and it's effective you're on mute bridget We have uh, we have a product that's very very nice. It's a it's a disinfection tower, which is uh, really big, where you can place information on, um, especially on festivals, where you have contactless hand washing and disinfection, and it's uh, so big that you have the social distancing for sure. Even if there are three sinks in that tower. Uh, and you can place anything uh, above the, the sink, you know, like advertising or information about um, how to behave or uh, security information or stuff like that. That's what I like. <laughs> Fantastic. John? Uh, I think for me, the um, back, back to Adam's point, the making it intuitive and familiar is more likely to get widespread endorsement and pick up um, and also having something that probably just meets and exceeds your expectations in terms of your experience. So I think um, the development and how we're doing ticketing for um, using smartphones, you know, pre-screening, turning up, um, contactless validation, getting in, uh, then just the ordering system off the back of that. You know, could we develop that you've got QR ordering from your seat that you could end up with um, a menu that you order, pay for, and somebody brings to your seat? You know, all of that kind of stuff, I think, for me, is trying to create that experience that people are pleasantly surprised by that's not too unfamiliar. Fantastic. Well, um, that brings us uh, to the close of this um, COVID technology uh, discussion. Um, thank you very much uh, to all our panelists, Bridget, Joran, uh, Paul, John, and Adam. Um, we've seen, I mean, for me, the big takeaways are, it's, it sounds like it's all about um, flexibility, um, being able to deploy technology in a range of different environments. It's around consumer confidence. Um, and it's around, I think, the, the safety element from us, from the staff and the, the the um, you know the, the show presentation piece. I think there's a there's I think there's a confidence because I think people in the event industry trust each other to do the right thing. Right. I think it is definitely more of a question around um, around consumer and attendee confidence, um, getting that balance right, um, and and kind of optimizing costs using technology to make sure that we don't have um, over time we can reduce that compliance um, cost to become a, ma a manageable cost. As we move forward through this um, into this post-COVID reality, um, thank you very much to uh, to everyone here. Um, thanks to everyone who's been watching and sending in um, some good questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, um, and thank you to the uh, wonderful folks at IQ for giving us the opportunity to talk about this fascinating and really uh, critical topic as we um, as we try and rejuvenate the industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.